Hi everybody, this is a film to announce the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival. It's going to be taking place at the end of May, so we wanted to take the opportunity to explain what it is, why we're doing it, and also who's going to be there. So we've got a really exciting lineup of speakers, and all of them in some way are going to be talking about themes we've covered on the channel. So from the meaning crisis, to difficulty of sense making, to the information ecology, and new practices that help us see the world differently, move forward in different ways. And on that note as well, we have a really top-notch lineup of facilitators. So as well as the talks, which give us a kind of scaffolding and framing, it's going to be a lot of transformative experiences from breath work and circling, even improv and jazz workshops. So it's going to be a whole, really a festival, a kind of choose your own adventure festival. So in this film, we're going to talk about the whole outline of the festival, introduce the speakers, play some clips from the speakers, and try and explain why we feel that this is a kind of culmination of the last two years of the kind of journey of the channel and really looking into kind of the meaning crisis, how difficult it is to, to make sense of the world in an environment where a lot of our institutions are failing to make sense of it. And then this very much sense and understanding that we have to really come back to our own sovereignty, our own discernment and how we the practices to, to do that as well. And in a way, we started this process of doing it live last year, or almost a year to the day when the festival will be last May uh, at the Rebelwism Summit. And so the summit, we capped at the Dunbar number, which was 150 people, and had uh, four speakers. We had Ian McGilchrist, Brett Weinstein, Heather Hying, and Jordan Hall. And we also broke out into groups to have discussions about cultural topics we, we find it difficult to discuss. So it's kind of early exploration into how do we make sense together. And we learned a lot from the summit. And basically one of the things we wanted to do is, is make it bigger and better. So instead of having one day, instead of capping the numbers, we put it over two days and making it this, this format where we have a lot on offer. That's why we're calling it a festival. There's lots to do. And you choose what you want to do. So there'll be, a, you know, you might want to go and see a lot of talks. You might want to do a lot of discussion groups. You might want to do a lot of embodied practices like breath work or circling whatever it might be, and of course you can combine all of them together. So, so the point is to really give, in a way, putting our money where our mouth is, we talk a lot about the importance of doing these practices into getting into different ways of perceiving, and so it's, a, it's creating a space where we can do that, where we can actually have the option to do all of these different things and then connect with each other and, and uh, hopefully make sense in a, in a new way. Yeah, and I'd say that was the main learning that we had from the summit last year was what we tried to do with the summit was curate one experience that all 150 people went through. And I think our big learning from that was that paradoxically, if you give more options, then you can actually go deeper. Because some people really enjoyed the, the sense making together, others just wanted to kind of just see the people up on stage, which is fine. Like if that's where, if that's your kind of, what, what you want from a, from a live experience, then you can do that. You can just go to the talks, but with this option, because you choose your own adventure, we can actually offer slightly deeper experiences like breath work, like a sense making workshop. And paradoxically, we realize that by, by not curating one experience for everyone, where you then have to kind of go, oh, is that going to be a bit too much? Is that going to be a bit too much? You can actually go deeper. So I think this is, this is our learning, and this is why we've decided to go deeper, bigger, and with more options for the, the festival this time. We also have an amazing venue in the center of London. It's much bigger than the venue we had for the summit, and it's got four stories to it. So that allows us to have multiple things running at the same time. There's also uh, three different sort of narrative tracks running through it. And the three are meaning. So meaning is a really big one. It's, it's a topic we've been covering on the channel since the beginning. We've been covering the meaning crisis, this kind of loss of connection we have in uh, you know, our own narrative, our own historical trajectory, how that plays out in culture. And there's also practices that connect us to meaning. So we're going to have both of those, talks, workshops. The next track we have is Imagine Futures. And Imagine Futures includes a lot of the systems theorists and that kind of wider, big picture systems thinking, which we've also had on the channel a lot. And it's not just big picture thinking, but it's also exploring things like psychedelic medicine, which might start changing paradigms. It's exploring anything that's really looking to the future. And the third track is Cultural Shadows. And Cultural Shadows runs through both those previous tracks in some ways. And what are we not looking at when we're talking about these things? What are the things we don't quite know how to discuss? What are the things that are our blind spots? 
and that's going to really run through the entire festival. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to that as well. I think it's really important to have the discussions, but also surface what we're not talking about. It's quite rare that we have the opportunity to do that at an event. So let's introduce the speakers. First up, we have Rupert Sheldrake, who we've had on the channel a couple of times and is kind of an elder statesman of these bigger questions about paradigm shift. Like he's, he's obviously a very controversial figure in the world of science and still kind of mainstream, um, isn't entirely sure what to do with him. But he's been plugging away at this kind of where is the scientific paradigm falling short and where are the potential shifts. And he's been involved in these conversations since like SLN it, with people like Terence McKenna and many of the, the kind of countercultural figures of the 70s and 80s. And he's kind of a link back to the past and also kind of framing of what are the lessons that maybe um, he and others who were involved in these conversations from the 70s and 80s onwards can use, can bring to shed light on where we're at now. So let's play a short clip from Rupert. Because I'm a kind of proclaimed heretic in the world of science, I mean, it's not me that proclaims that, but I'm sort of branded as a heretic. Um, then the normal gatekeepers and the mainstream media are rather back off when it's anything to do with me because it's too controversial. It's not that they're afraid of the views I'm putting forward, they're afraid of people criticizing them for allowing these views to be expressed. And are you, do, are you feeling at all vindicated yet, or are you, is that some way off yet? Well, the points I was making in the science delusion, the, the ten dogmas of science that I was talking about, uh, the changes that have happened in science since it came out have all gone in the direction I was suggesting. And then we have Daniel Schmachtenberger, who a lot of viewers will be familiar with from the War on Sensemaking piece and some of the other pieces that we put out on the channel. And Daniel brings a really fascinating mix of sort of deep, granular understanding of why it's so hard to make sense of the world, why the information ecology is so damaged, together with a really broad sweep of systems change, paradigm shift, and what is the what is the nature of the crisis that we seem to be in at the moment and seems to be accelerating and what might come next? We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind, right? And so I think many of the people that you've had on Rebel Wisdom have been in a deep inquiry around how do we actually fix our own sense making? And it's some of what has brought us to have conversations with each other because a part of how we work with our own sense making is we recognize the cognitive complexity of issues that the world faces is more than a single person can process, a single brain that can't actually hold that cognitive complexity. So it requires collective intelligence and collective sense making. But I can't just offload the cognitive complexity to some authority because I can't trust that they're actually doing good sense making. Maybe they're doing good sense making within a very limited context, but then the application of that outside of the context is different, and maybe there's even distortions within their context. So I have to try and find other people that are also really endeavoring to sense make well, which means they have to understand what causes failures in sense making. And then we have to see can we create relationships with each other that remove the distortion basis that is normally there. So um, I think, I think. What I, from what I have seen of Rebel Wisdom, this is probably the strange attractor of what is bringing everybody to watch it, is people who are trying to make sense of the world better themselves and are trying to find sources of content of other, of other people that have been trying to make sense of it well, <clears throat> which is what I'm excited about. And so those are just some opening thoughts. And yeah, I look forward to getting into why we have as broken an information ecology as we have and what it would take to correct that at, a, at scale. So it's interesting you talked about the historical trajectory of these kind of conversations because the next speaker we want to talk about uh, is Nora Bateson. And Nora Bateson is a, a filmmaker, a systems theorist, and she, through the Bateson Institute, is carrying on as well the work of her father, who was Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson is uh, one of the most well-known philosophers in systems theory and cybernetics and quite a few other areas of, of the 20th century. So 
Nora has, I think, a very interesting take on systems change, which she actually refers to as systems learning. So moving beyond seeing it from a kind of engineering mode as a fixed system to seeing it as a very alive uh, system. So uh, I'll just play a, we'll play a clip from Nora now. There's plenty of great information you can get with reductionist process, but you can't understand Understand how the vitality of a living system is actually shifting and moving. And if it's not shifting and moving, it's not alive anymore. So we have a, we have a conundrum there of how we're going to think about what information is when so much of what has been developed in terms of what we think of as authorized information is static. And what we need to understand and respond to is complex and alive. So Nora is also going to be running something called a warm data lab, which is very much based around the idea that information can't be taken out of its context. We have to look at every piece of information as relationally connected to other pieces of information. The workshop's all about how do we start perceiving in that way and how do we start solving problems using that methodology. So then we have one of our favorite people, John Viveki, who many of you will know from his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, which made him a kind of little cult figure online. And we've had him on the channel a number of times. And in this, he will be speaking directly to the meaning crisis. What is the meaning crisis? What are the deep stories of Western culture that have led us to the point where we're at now? And where might we go next? And in addition to the talk that he's going to be giving, he's also going to be leading a workshop with Peter Lindbergh, who you might know from Culture War 2.0, about dialogos. Dialogos being a live conversation between more than one person. How do we come to truth together? What is the process of arriving at wisdom? All of these deep questions. So we're really excited about what he's going to bring. The problem that's happened for us is that the worldview within which our wisdom traditions arose has been significantly undermined for a host of very inter interconnected and complex historical reasons that have to do with things like the Protestant Reformation, the emergence of the scientific worldview, um, uh, the movements in uh, the separation of philosophy uh, from a, a transformative set of practices, unlike what it was in the ancient world with Socrates or Plato. Uh, we get the loss of wisdom institutions like the, the, the monastic tradition within the West is destroyed uh, because of the Protestant Reformation. So for a whole host of historical reasons, we have a worldview in which we as meaning makers don't belong. And then we also, and that worldview also doesn't tell, it tells us how to get information. And even if, right, even if you, um, if you want to give sort of a broad reading to science, it tells us how to get knowledge, but it really doesn't tell us how to cultivate wisdom. And that leads on to our next speaker, who's Gail Bradbrook. So a lot of the stuff Daniel Schmachtenberg is talking about, this, uh, this sense of our current system reaching a point where it's not really working anymore, there's a lot of groups around the world who are in some way responding to that. And one of the most successful recently and largest has been Extinction Rebellion. And Gail is uh, one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion. So it's interesting to get a take on how is this actually playing out practically and how are people organizing and mobilizing around issues like this. So on that subject of the way new paradigms are starting to come up in society in lots of different areas, we have Dr. Rosalind Watts, who's the clinical lead at uh, Imperial on the psilocybin for depression trial, and has been working in that area for a number of years. And we'll be talking about how this new paradigm of psychedelic medicine starts to uh, kind of turn on its head the, the previous paradigm we've had around medicine and what, what does it actually mean? What, does it actually, what, what do we need to know about that? Is there a tension between, because a lot of the time with, with the medical model, the idea is you take a pill and it has this effect on you, like it's a very kind of material idea or a very mechanistic <laughs> assumption. It feels that there's something very different going on with psychedelics. Do you think there's a, there's a weird tension there? <clears throat> I think it's a very good tension because I think the tension that is there has the power to really transform our system of care. I think what psychedelics bring about is this absolute paradigm shift in that you can't use psychedelics in that way. Psychedelics will never be able to safely be put into a kind of conveyor belt system of care. They will radically transform any system of care they're brought into because in order to do them safely, um, you need all the things that I think are important for therapeutic change to happen. So you absolutely cannot give a psychedelic substance to someone without proper trust. And that means proper trust that they have for themselves, 
for the therapist, for psil the psilocybin substance, like proper, proper trust. And that doesn't get developed overnight. So staying on the theme of new paradigms, we have Jules Evans, a philosopher who's been on the channel a few times. He actually wrote a really fascinating piece called, Dude, Where's My Paradigm Shift? Kind of saying, there's been this conversation since at least the 1960s and probably earlier than this about, oh, we're on the kind of frothy edge of something new and why has that not happened? Uh, and is it kind of very naive to even think about things in that way and talk about things in that way? Very possibly. That could be a piece for the cultural shadows to kind of talk about, is this whole idea kind of just naive, wishful thinking? But Jules is a really, really fascinating thinker because he very deeply learned in, in sort of various different types of philosophy, kind of very much was uh, very involved in the Stoic mu movement for a long time, and then got a sense that it was missing something, that Stoicism was missing the sort of deep, lived, transformational side of things. I was interested in the history of ecstatic experiences, and I feel like Western culture rather marginalised and pathologised ecstasy, starting from around the Reformation. As in, by pathologised, I mean it got redefined as a mental illness. Um, so in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, rationalist, materialist thinkers like Thomas Hobbes would say ecstasy is um, enthusiasm, it's delusion. You're just letting yourself be carried away with your imagination. Uh, uh, in the 19th century, psychiatrists like Jean-Martin Charcot said ecstasy is just hysteria, a symptom of a brain disorder. All the ecstatics of yesteryear, he said, from Joan of Arc to Socrates to Muhammad, are actually suffering from brain disorders. Um, 20th century psychiatry said something similar. You know, if you say, oh, I'm, the spirits are talking to me, I'm connected to the universe, that's actually just psychosis. Um, so that's the main story, I think, and as a result of that, there's a taboo around ecstasy. This is something that Stan Groff talks really well about. Yeah. Stan, Stan Groff is very important in this, in this kind of thing. So psychiatry pathologized um, ecstasy. So we still have these experiences because they're naturally occurring, but we don't talk about them because we don't want to look ridiculous or stupid or mad. So one of the themes we've been exploring on the channel as well is collective intelligence, this idea of us being more than the sum of our parts when we come together to you know, solve a problem or make sense of the world together. And there's a, a metaphor that keeps coming up over and over again, which is jazz. So a jazz ensemble is, is often held up as, a, you know, kind of the perfect uh, collective intelligence idea, metaphor. And there's probably no bigger expert on that than Greg Thomas, who's our next speaker. And Greg runs with his wife, Jewel, the Jazz Leadership Project. And so he's really excellent at explaining, taking the theory of collective intelligence and then mapping it against this jazz metaphor. That's why when I saw that conversation and other work on Rebel Wisdom, it's exciting because you have folks that are listening deeply, which is another very important practice in jazz that we should discuss, but they're coming forth with information and perspectives that's deeply informed. So when jazz artists are playing together, great jazz artists, they're doing so in a way where they're communicating, they're having a conversation, they're respecting the individuality and leadership potential, we call that shared leadership, of the others as they engage in the moment. So say the saxophonist solos first, the saxophonist is the leader in that moment and everyone is supporting him or her. Same with the trumpet. And then the rhythm section, they also get a chance to solo or improvise. So that's one of the models of shared leadership. And that's the same thing that happens in conversations among friends, particularly deeply informed friends. So Greg and his wife, Jewel, are also gonna be running a jazz leadership project workshop to kind of give, give us all a lived experience of, of these ideas. So then we have Alex Evans, who has been on the channel talking about his collective psychology project. But before that, in 2017, he wrote a really influential book called The Myth Gap. And Alex's background is in policy making. He was a government advisor for many years. And what he noticed was that the conversation was very, very narrow. It was all about statistics and very dry. And he was sort of sensing there's something really missing here. And what's missing is this sense of deep stories that actually can move people and put, um, be genuinely sort of transformational. What, what would, and the myth gap was all about that. It's like, well, religions have got this. 
and there seems to be a gap where religion normally goes, and that's having such a big kind of sweeping impact on us as as people. At their best, religions have really performed this role of kind of putting tools for agency out there into the world. And in terms of belonging, of course, religions have been all about creating congregational spaces where people feel like they can belong in spite of their differences, in spite of their shortcomings. So that's, if you like, a separate set of things um, that religions have historically done for us. But, you know, as with myth, it's something that turns out to be incredibly important for our collective psychological health. And now we're looking around for, you know, how to fill that gap. So then we have Peter Lindbergh, who we recently featured on the channel with the Culture War 2.0 piece. And that's been a really influential piece uh, in this sort of wider sense-making conversation. I think the, the framing of mimetic tribes, the idea of mimetic mediation, and some of the other concepts that were put forward in that piece have had a have really illustrated a lot of what's going on from a sort of broader cultural perspective. One aspect about mimetic tribes is this the sense that they're disembodied because they're exercising this sense of tribalism around a certain idea, a certain ideology, a certain meanplex, but they're not really meeting or cohering in person. And there's a, an egoic aspect to this. They're, there's, they're egoically attached to the ideas that they're are fighting uh, with. Where I think what Rebel Wisdom is uh, gesturing towards and various different people in the sense-making web is trying to create an embodied tribe where people actually get together in person and explore ideas. And also Peter will be running a workshop around mimetic tribes and Culture War 2.0. And as well as the speakers, we have some amazing facilitators running everything from circling workshops through the breath work, transformative tech, discussion and inquiry groups, and even uh, improv, and of course, jazz. And last but not least, there will be a big party as well. So we're still adding facilitators and speakers, so keep watching the website to be updated about that. And a reminder of the date, it's the 30th and 31st of May. So there's a lot going on at the festival, there's a lot of options to choose from, and it's very much a, a pick-your-own-adventure experience. We also have some surprises planned to make it more of an immersive experience, which we won't go into now. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, just visit the website. You can read in more detail who's there, what the format's going to be, and what to expect. And we hope to see you there. Like to be heard. I sing it. Should I sing this whole thing? That'd be weird. Welcome to the Rebel Wisdom Festival. <laughs> We've done a summit and it was good, but this will be better. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs>